pum pum. Chicka pum pum. Chicka pum pum. Chicka pum. This is Kerr. This is Kerr Blog. I'm joined today by another first time guest, uh, a very cool one. This is uh, a guy whose work I've been following for about a decade now. He's been doing flash animation. Uh, for various cartoons and, and series is, is, is since the early 2000s. He's currently known for his work on his YouTube channel, Cartoon Drive Through. I'm joined by uh, the lovely and talented Matt Wilson. Say hi, Matt. Hello. Uh, I think this is, this is interesting, too, because I think this is the, the first time you've recorded something for me since, God, I think, like, I don't remember what year it was, but on, on the old uh, TV Tome adventures, I had you do, like, a little, like, one probably, episode. Probably, probably. So I gave Matt a sort of general invite to be on a curb block like this, and uh, depending on what the topic was, and I was sifting through a bunch of ones that I was sitting on for a while, and uh, went through a few that I thought uh, he'd be interested in talking about, and uh, we came across two that uh, I think would make for a good discussion, so uh, hopefully you guys will get something out of, uh, out of both of these combined. Uh, the first question for this one comes from Space Zoomer, who asked, Hey, Curb, I was wondering what your opinions are of artists working for free or asking to be paid for their work. Uh, would you ever work for free? Do you think artists should or should not work for free? What are the advantages and disadvantages? I've seen interviews with people like Harlan Ellison and Stephen Silver on the subject, and they seem to have very strong opinions. I was wondering what yours are. And then the second question uh, comes from Soup in a Cup, uh, 96 who asked, do you think that selling out is a necessar- uh, necessarily a bad thing, even if it's extremely helpful for a channel, show, or project? So, Matt, for those who are listening that aren't necessarily familiar with your work, you've done everything from uh, original content creation for many, many, many years to freelance work to studio work, and uh, I know you've been around the corner with a lot of these kind of experiences. So uh, what are your general thoughts on this whole deal? <laughs> yeah, um... I am really not a fan of exposure. One of my favorite Twitters is the For Exposure Tumblr or a Twitter account. Um, there are so many glorious tweets there. Um, I've never gained any benefit from exposure. I once had the front page of Patreon for a week, um, and I thought that was super cool. But I had a net loss of one <laughs> of one backer despite being on the front page for a week. So, you know, just personally, exposure doesn't help me (laughs) in the slightest. Um, But yeah, I have strong opinions on doing work for free. Now, if it's for a peer, um, if it is for a friend, I might consider doing something to help them out. Although my friends are generally pretty savvy and they know not to ask me to do animation for them for free. Um, this is a process and it's why I know that there are illustrators that do work for free for exposure. Don't know why there are cartoonists that do work for free for exposure. Don't know why, but at least that like a drawing could be a few hours out of your day. Animation is a job, no matter whether you're doing it for a career or a hobby, you're spending an eternal amount of time producing it. Um, and we're already undervalued as it is. So I do not understand why people do it for free. Um, and I've seen some people say, I've seen like, um, cause I'm in the channel Frederator community, not to get too like hush, hush, secret, secret, but I mean, like I see people in there, um, who are in sort of the larger YouTube community of animators. They'll do collaborations, which I think is fine, but then they'll link to articles where I'll see, like, get your work out there, do some work for free, and I'm just, like, shaking my head. I I think that you have a responsibility to all of the other artists out there not to devalue them by devaluing yourself. Because I think you set a precedent that companies are hoping for so that they can continue to take advantage of artists. Um... So I don't like people who participate in contests where there's a prize. Um, I don't like doing anything for exposure. I don't like anybody who runs a Kickstarter saying, we'll pay you after the Kickstarter is funded. No, you could could pay me now. You could pay me now and then I'll do work for you. 
Um, yeah, I've gotten a few offers um, over the mail, the mail wire, way back in the day when I was doing commissions, and, and even more recently I've gotten a couple of requests, and I've always said, like, am I getting paid? <laughs> Well, and I guess there's there seems to be like there's two big things that uh, make people even want to to do that in the first place. The first, I mean, I guess not always necessarily just an internship kind of setting, but like you know any kind of art. It's like if some of your first opportunities are like you know people offer, hey, I'll do this for free just to get some experience or oh whatever, like, and it's not becoming a massive detriment of like oh you're missing out on a lot of money that you could be making. Uh, I, cause in, in my early career, I, I never, uh, I never got like, you know, really hardcore screwed over by like doing something underpaid or for free or whatever. Uh, but there were a few times where I was like, oh, well, let me just try this just so I can like, you know, kind of train myself in this type of animation or this type of art or voiceover or whatever. Uh, but then there also has to be a point in time where you do hold a certain level of value in yourself. And it's like, okay, I'm at a competitive level and I should be paid for what it is that I'm doing. The other reason, and this is kind of, I won't even name some specific names, but I'm sure, Matt, you probably know certain ones I'm referring to, where, say, creators who have, uh, you know, a massive following, because, say, maybe they had a show on TV that people grew up with, young, budding artists and animators that really want the opportunity to work with that creator because they inspired them so much to want to be an artist or an animator or whatever, and then, you know said creators will hire them on board some sort of project, sometimes even on Kickstarters and such things, and they are not paid a goddamn cent. And it's even worse when, after they have been completely manipulated, they're like, oh, but it's okay because, boo, you know, inspired me as a child, and no way, I, I, anything I could do to help them was worth it. That was payment enough, which I hate to say that that is still not only a thing that's happening with some creators, not all, only very few, but even other web uh, creators and things who were you know, kind of early adopters that have massive followings. They just take advantage of people who are a little too, like, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed to be like, no, no, it's okay, I'm I, I'm enjoying this, though. And it's like, that's that's not good for anybody <laughs> on the same level. Well, I mean, that's what they're hoping for, right? They're hoping that you have a low opinion of yourself or your work. Um, the, the, there's this thing about our society where... If the job you're doing is fun, you're not supposed to be paid for it. Like, you're not supposed to be paid to have fun, you know? And not to say that animation is is necessarily the most fun job. No. It is a very <laughs> tedious job at times. But I love what I do for a living. Right. And I, I don't know if it, there's a bitterness or a jealousness, but I do see people who feel that, you know... Because I, I know there's a lot of resentment over um, Twitch streamers... Um, who make a lot of money from their their donation donators, um, who are saying like that's not a real job, you know? And I feel like that could be applied to anybody who enjoys their work. And I think there's some of that too. Um, I think that artists feel guilty if they they enjoy what they do for a living, so they're like, oh, you know, this is just fun for me. I I don't need to be I don't need to be paid, you know. I just like doing it. Um, that's one of the reasons that I don't have voice actors in my cartoons because I keep getting requests from people to do them the voice work for free, and I'm like, no, I want to pay you. <laughs> I, I want to pay you, and I don't care if you're refusing because your work has value if you are trying to make it in the voice acting industry, which has very few jobs. Yeah. Um, um, which is incredibly respectable because, I mean, there are I, – I think voiceover work on, on the internet right now, probably more than any other, like, I'm having fun with this artistic kind of career is probably the most thing that people, like, do not get paid for, you know, whether it's for exposure or just to get the experience or whatever, you know, wh whether it's a positive or a negative reason, that happens the most, and it sucks. So, but yeah, I could go on I about mean, that forever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and it might go in tandem with the second question, but I've even seen, like, artists devalue other artists. I don't want to name names, but, um, Simon's Cat had a Kickstarter, right? They had a Kickstarter to do a, um, a film, or, or I think, like, a short film okay. that was going to take them about six months. And they raised, 
I don't know. They 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 didn't raise a ton of money. They didn't raise the kind of money that the uh, Bee and Puppy Cat Kickstarter made. Yeah. But I saw people animators on Twitter peers. These were not professional like you know ten year industry veterans. These were like YouTube animators. Yeah. But they were they were calling the Simon's Cat people greedy. That they were asking for too much. Um, that they'd never do something like that. And I did the math for the amount of staff people that they'd have in the studio. And this is not even counting studio overhead. Yeah. But the money that the the salaries that these people were going to make to work on this project were less than the normal working salary for animators. Mm-hmm. And this is like, this is called greedy. Like trying to make a living is called greedy. <laughs> Which is funny because, you know, as you were also mentioning, I think, a couple of weeks ago, like, Simon's Cat is one of, if not the only, series on YouTube that was an original concept, was not built off of any pre-existing material, wasn't a video game parody or whatever, did not have a previous following that it carried over from Newgrounds. It just, the guy worked hard, did great, amazing stuff that really took off, and it's like, the guy completely deserves whatever he gets, and he's been getting a lot of really great opportunities, and making a lot of money and i think that that's fantastic i don't know who particularly even was ripping on that person but that that seems very like why <laughs> i don't know i was very disappointed i went into a subtweet um rant that day uh i don't know that anybody hopefully nobody saw it and then thought up oh, they're talking about me uh, blocked <laughs> well even if they did fuck him um, I guess on the, the quote-unquote selling out thing, this is actually the, the thing I'm the most interested in asking you about because so now, and even people who are listening that have heard some of my other ones kind of relating to this subject know, the game with making money off of the internet has completely changed, you know, slowly but surely over the last several years. And, uh, you know, dating back to, like, God, I, I, what, 2004, 2005 with, like, Keen Spot and a lot of that stuff, it's like... And you know, there were other folks kind of in that area, like Foamy and Tomorrow's Nobodies and, and some of the early Newgrounds folks. I know that you never really, like, adopted Newgrounds, like, all that closely. Um, but, uh, but it, like, back then it seemed like, oh, you know, merchandise at best, if you could even get a merchandising deal, uh, or, or convention appearances, which even those were rare, too. It's like, how... Like, did you, if, if you did at all, I don't know, but, like, in those early days, uh, you know, before YouTube kind of became a standard, did, did you make money doing your own stuff, like, at all? Like, how did you even kind of get your footing doing that? I made money off of ad revenue, but it was not very much because before YouTube, you had to host the files yourself on your own server. Mm -hmm. And SWF files, you know, were a couple megabytes each. And back then, if you if you had that kind of traffic, it almost was a detriment because the bandwidth costs had not yet, you know, dropped to the point where you were breaking even all that much. Um, so the one time when I did make money off of my cartoons when I was working on Bonus Stage was when I did the... In 2006, I did the special episode. I did the the episode after I finished the series, mm -hmm. and I put that on BitPass. I think that's what it was called. Right. Um, that was micropayments in a time before... That was way too far ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. um, and I got a couple hundred bucks for it. Um, so essentially, that's kind of what Patreon is now. Yeah. Because I'm getting a couple hundred bucks per cartoon now. Um, so... That was my deal. I did have a couple of t-shirts. I was kind of reined into an exclusivity deal um, with my host, with my web host. Um, so I could not do a whole ton of merchandise. And I don't have merchandise now. I really should. But I'm not, I'm not much of an ideas person when it comes to merchandise. Um, but yeah, the money was hard to come by back then. And... It's hard to come by now. I'm just scraping by. But let me say something about selling out. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is such a thing as selling out because it, that implies that you've made it and you don't have to work again. And that's not true. You know, 
um, I remember someone saying this in another, another podcast, but like Pamplemouse, Pamplemousse, mm-hmm. what was their name? Um, they did those ads for Toyota or whatever, where they were singing the Christmas songs, and those were on TV, and it's like, oh, they sold out. Well, they made money for this year for doing commercials for Toyota, but those commercials won't air now. They don't air now. They're not making money from that now. They yeah. got to work on the next thing. Yeah. They got to find a, a new way to make money. We're all we're always trying to find new revenue streams, and I don't consider it a a, lock, a lack of integrity if somebody is doing what makes the most business sense for them. I think the only hard stand I I take is when it comes to fan work. If you get super popular making money off of copyright infringement, I think there's a legal there's a there's a legal problem there. Um my so- my stance on fan art has kind of softened in the past year, but I still feel that if you're making money selling, you know, Doctor Who mashup t-shirts yeah. and pr- and fan prints of My Little Pony, then that's good for you, I guess, but you should be doing original stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, if, if that's literally all that you're doing and that's entirely how you make your money, then it's like, okay, that's a little fucked up. Um, yep. I, I've talked about that before as well. For me, and I guess this is kind of my stance on the, the, the term, is um, I guess it comes down to individual, like, moral values like okay i'll I'll even go ahead and use a specific example because i don't think it's that big of a deal so i'm pretty particular when it comes to merchandise i guess i'll just use that as the the main kind of thing here uh i don't feel the need to like you know every time i would produce a new episode of tome for instance if there was some funny joke or something that was like kind of memeable or you know could be made into a tumblr gif or something uh you know i wouldn't feel the need to like go to level up studios and be like make a new t-shirt out of it or whatever i really only have like three of them and we have like some new merch coming out that are just basic kind of like buttons and stickers and you know stuff like that Mm -hmm. and I felt like I guess I don't even know if it's like a moral standpoint that's not the best way to word it but like so Bravest Warriors like the first episode came out and they had like three t-shirts of all of like what they probably thought were like the most memeable jokes uh, out immediately after the first episode and I think actually when it launched it was like the 9000% sexy and all that stuff or whatever and to me, like, I guess I can't help but, like, roll my eyes. Like, it's like, so you're just kind of immediately presumptuously, pr- presumptuously expecting the show to be super funny and everybody will love these jokes and want to buy all the T-shirts. And, you know, but at the same time, it's like, well, they have the resources to do that. If they're confident that their product will do that, and which, you know, it did really take off, Brave- Bravest Warriors ended up being really successful – then they're perfectly content to do that. And I, and I realize, like, you know what? It's not fair for me to judge that because even though I wouldn't personally do that, they're complete, and they made it themselves. Like, even if it's a little eye roll inducing to me, that doesn't mean that it's inherently a bad thing for them to be doing because it's a business. It's, it's, they're perfectly content to do that. And similarly, if, you know, if, if people have to find ways to, you know, to earn their living. I mean, because even then, like, past the content creation, I mean, like, you and I, I imagine, both have done commissions and, you know, things on the side to, you know, that sometimes yep. pay the bills a little bit more than YouTube had rev and et cetera. Um, you know, that's just kind of how it goes. Like, this is, it, it's, uh, Rob Paulson often says, nobody put a gun to my head and said you had to be an artist or whatever. Uh, it's completely true. So, like, you do ha- have to kind of find whatever ways you can to make this stuff work and make a living because as going back to the earlier point you need to value work and making a living off of what you do is important and you've got to stay level headed about it for sure that's why i don't begrudge animators who do video game content and i'm probably going to do some as well not in the not necessarily in the let's play style but it does seem like a necessary evil based on the youtube revenue system where you have to have much more frequent content than what work capable of producing Mm -hmm. and minutes watched is also an important metric and producing frequent animated content that has long that is long running is an an impossibility for anyone even if i did it in the style of bonus stage you know game show is the closest i came to like that really low budget style and that required a couple weeks of preparation um for e3 and then I was kind of 
got got almost no sleep during E3, just working nonstop. <laughs> had back pain from hunch, being hunched over the Cintiq afterwards. Um... I've lost my train of thought, but the point is... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say real quick, I, I did enjoy Game Show a lot, and uh, I appreciated a little post-credits joke at the final one. <laughs> it, was a little, it was a little callback, a little shout-out. I'm going to be doing a Game Show E3 thing this year, too, but it's not going to be like last year. That was, that was a killer yeah. uh, on me physically. Um, but yeah, no, there's, there's no such thing. No such thing as selling out. Um, you got to do what you got to do. And I'll say about Channel Frederator, um, that's not how I would recommend a, an independent person go about it. You know, don't design the, the t-shirts, you know, before you launch the show. Um, but I think that they, being a, biz, being a studio and a business, um, they kind of have a, a track record. They're not all, I believe they're in the same building as YouTube, something like that. So I think they kind of have their finger on the pulse of what is going to be successful on YouTube. And I've seen even them, you know, they had their huge success in Bravest Warriors. They've had their huge success in being Puppy Cat, but they still have to produce a lot of content in between those seasons because it takes, you know, six to nine months to do those seasons because it's traditionally animated and sent overseas, like a TV show. Um, so, in between Bravest Warriors and being Puppy Cat, because right now they're in a, a hiatus period, they have to do all these things like two nerds, um, these these countdown shows. Um, they acquired Finn Punch. Um, uh, they showcase, you know, fan art. They say like, here we're going to be at this convention. So they they too have to constantly produce content um and scrap things together even though they're a huge studio so they're they're not too much different than us even though they have an advantage because they are much larger than all of us combined um so yeah there's no selling out at any level you're just trying to you're just trying to make it work you're just trying to make a living i agree uh, and I've uh, I've learned a lot actually from Frederator and you over the years, and in, in terms of applying to my own stuff, and it's definitely turned out pretty well. There's definitely a lot more that I want to go beyond that, but uh, I guess in conclusion, uh, well, well, first of all, I want you to plug your stuff because uh, Matt, everybody produces a lot of shit all the time and deserves like legit way more subscribers than he has. So uh, stuff you're up to right now and planning on, do other than obviously more game show stuff during E3, but uh, continuing with Puzzle Hunters and etc. Yeah, so I do a show called Deadly Space Action, which just um, wrapped up its uh, th- third quasi season. Um, it's a show about a um, evil space captain and his insubordinate crew. They try to conquer the galaxy and they usually fail. Um, so that's up to three seasons now. There's a couple hours worth of uh, cartoons there for that. I'm starting on the Puzzle Hunters. I've released a couple of one-shot cartoons called Puzzle Hunters Turbo to lead up to the series, which will be airing at a later date. It'll be airing on Patreon this month, but I don't know when it will be airing on YouTube yet. Um, I am working on a fantasy idea called Princess Ness and the Perilous Quest, um, which is kind of like an anachronistic D&D show meets Lupin the Third. Um, and so I'm currently in the script stage on that. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of cartoon series and I'm planning to do more curation type stuff. I'm working on a, um, kind of a quick look slash, uh, overview style, um, video game show called Vania Mania, where I'll be, um, spotlighting a lot of Metroidvania games. That's kind of my jam. And very few people buy them, so I'm hoping to curate those and get people interested in them. And uh, Drive Through Drive In is going to be a show where I ha- kind of point people towards really cool independent animated shorts um, because I've I'm always on the lookout for them. I have hours of them kind of saved in a private playlist, and 
I just think that the work people are doing out there is so amazing. Um, and they deserve to be paid for it. <laughs> the end. <laughs> I don't disagree. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to all that stuff. And uh, everybody, I'll have an annotation during that whole thing. Uh, go check out Matt's channel. Subscribe to him. Uh, maybe consider... Uh, uh, how, how do you, what, what do you call uh, subscribing to a Patreon? Is there a specific term for that? I forget. I just back it. It's about um, backing, yeah. right? Be, consider yeah. becoming a backer. Uh, yeah, you get um, early access cartoons, and now you're going to be getting them a lot earlier than YouTube because I'm changing my YouTube philosophy because the way that the YouTube uh, money model works, I feel that I'm going to have to um, change things up, air episodes a lot more close together, and then go on longer hiatus periods in between. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, the Patreon is going to be your way of seeing these cartoons before they air anywhere else. And it's, it's just $1 to get in on that. Uh, go to my sh channel first. Check out the cartoons first to see if you like them, of course. Um, and yeah, uh, give me support if you want to. I would really appreciate it. Yes, and, uh, and thank you, Matt, for joining me. And thank you very much for uh, really all the... I guess that sounds a little weird to say inspiration, but just, uh, I've, I really genuinely have, like, I've learned a lot over, like, the last decade, like, following all your stuff and a lot of things that you've said, uh, have really stuck. Um, most particularly, uh, the phrase rainbow sparkly uni unicorns that vomit happy juice has stuck with me, uh, from all those years. <laughs> I don't even wow. know. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Uh, and on that note, uh, everybody, thank you all for listening as well. If you have, uh, any thoughts on this if perhaps you are also uh, uh, yeah, any other content creators that follow me if you have any thoughts about this too I'd love to hear what you think uh, any, any others who are maybe thinking about getting into it or have any other questions maybe I'll answer some in the comments etc uh, leave some feedback I'd love to see it and if you have ideas for future Curblot topics leave a comment about that or hit me up on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, whatever you feel like and that'll do it. Uh, thank you again Matt I appreciate it and uh, we, You're welcome. we'll see you all next time. Bye bye bye